You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan White. Welcome to the BH Photography Podcast. My name is John Harris. I'm the producer of the show. Our host, Alan Whites, is on vacation this week, so we've brought in Todd Vorenkamp to be our co-host. We have with us Gabe Biederman from the B&H Road Marketing Team. He is a photographer, of course, and the author of the book Night Photography from Snapshots to Great Shots. It's a, it's a good book. It is a great book, yeah. Uh, welcome, Gabe. How you doing? I'm here. I'm hey, here. Gabe. <laughs> and uh, today's subject, fittingly, is gas. Gear acquisition <laughs> syndrome yep. and why you don't funny, need yeah. a new camera. <laughs> but really, why digital cameras are updated so frequently, whereas in the era of film, which I guess we're still in to some degree, that didn't happen so much. And Todd, I'm going to throw it to you with some of your uh, facts and figures. Sure. So I, uh, I, I looked up things on the internet. Mm-hmm. And uh, is that what, that's for? what did the World Wide Web tell us? <laughs> it told us everything that was true. <laughs> so I'll use the Nikon line to start because they have a fairly logical numbering system for their cameras. Mm. And if you go back to the film days of Nikon, back to the Nikon F, which was their first SLR mm-hmm. um, professional camera, that came out in 1959. And then if you wanted the next awesome professional Nikon SLR, you waited... 13 years for the Nikon F2 to show up. Mm-hmm. After that, they went on an eight-year cycle, so eight years between the F2 and F3, which was 1980, mm-hmm. eight years to the F4 in 88, eight years to the F5 in 96, eight years to the F6 in 2004, and now we're 11 years and counting, waiting for an F7, which <laughs> may or may well, not yeah. ever... You'll keep done. on waiting for that one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the digital side, the pro digital SLRs, the D1 came out in 1999, Four years later, the D2. Four years later, the D3. And then four years later, the D4. So if you look at that schedule, the D5 should arrive sometimes this year. Mm -hmm. And we've talked four years is for a digital camera is a pretty... Pretty long time. It's a good lifespan compared to other models from Mm -hmm. Nikon and things like that. So four years... I'll buy it. Yeah, and again, these are the, the top of the line. Yeah, pro those models. are pro. Yeah. Yeah. Those should be only pro only cameras, really. Those are people making who should be making money. Right. These guys are using their cameras every day. They're mm-hmm. beating them up probably, mm-hmm. and uh, so four years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then well, they, they also had the S's in mm-hmm. between right. with the threes, and so that's right. yeah, they do like which the, was a half the evolutionary upgrades, mm-hmm. I guess, or the uh, mm-hmm. and then on the other side, Canon came out with a 1D in 2001. The 1DS came out a year later. And then when you look at the 1D Mark II, 3, 4, and then the 1DX, you're looking at about a three-year cycle okay. from Canon, which is mm-hmm. a little bit shorter, but still mm-hmm. not hugely objectionable. So, and, they're, and they're due too, well, I would think, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, They are. The 1DX was uh, 2012, so... This five, could be a very three. gassy year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be for pro shooters. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, as we just mentioned, these are pro cameras, the top of the line. And I think that the subject, or at least the core of the subject, leans more toward the consumer cameras. Right. And I think, or at least I feel, that uh, that is what we're talking about here, basically. We're talking about consumer cycles. We're talking about ways mm-hmm. to get the average shooter to buy more stuff. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about the positives of the upgrades as well. But in general, these cameras are spun out every year just to sell more stuff. Right. I guess that's a fair assessment. When you're not talking about pro bodies, look at the prosumer Canon line that started with the 10D, 20D, all the way up to 70 Nina. The 10D came out and then five years, came out in 2003. Five years later, the 50D was out. So that was one camera a year. Mm -hmm. Five uh, prosumer cameras in five years. Now we're up to 70D Mm -hmm. in the paints still wet on the 60D and people, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's the same thing. If you, other companies run probably like a two, two and a half year cycle on their uh, flagship cameras. Mm-hmm. And uh, the question for the consumer is, do I chase this? Do I keep buying the new one or do I take a break and ignore the hands-on review on the B&H website, ignore <laughs> all the buzz on the internet about how great the new one is? Right. It's it's tough call. I don't yeah. know. And also, I guess, you know, there are some of those cameras along the lines that people really say, wow, that was the good one. Right. The one they made afterward, not so much. And, you know, that's arguable, but uh, 
I think that uh, it's, a, it's a good point of discussion for today. And as well as I have on my little list here that we're going to talk about the ruggedness of film cameras versus digital cameras. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, the technological advances that have happened in the past 10 years are amazing. Mm -hmm. So there's legitimate reason yeah. for some of these upgrades, or most many of these upgrades. And as we mentioned already, consumer cycles, marketing strategies, electronic waste, profit margins. And then we're going to get into our favorite subject, which is uh, rumor sites and fanboys <laughs> and how that has an, an, an impact on what's going on. So, Gabe, we've let you uh, sit here silently <laughs> for too long. <laughs> Anything you want to throw in at this point? Well, you know, uh, I think that cameras now are very much like computers, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I was, it's funny, I was just at an old, I was in, uh, it was Birmingham, Alabama, and I went to the Sloss uh, factory, and, and the Sloss factory was an old, you know, factory that was there. They have huge engineering feats. They have all the, and, I, and I'm talking to the guy on the tour, and he's like, "Yeah, when they have these, they, you know, when they were figuring out how to turn this, how to do this, it was build something bigger, mm -hmm. make something more mechanical." And that was in the 30s, 40s, 50s. You just built big things to get big work done. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with the advent of computers, we could now shrink down the processing of so many things. Um, and that's sort of what's happened with the film to digital eras. Now we've gone from sort of these, these cameras, these machines mm -hmm. that only really had X amount of moving parts and right. not, not, not many, right. You it know, to, to now we have a circuit board. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so many things can go wrong and so many things can get updated on but that. That's so that's a good point too. Many things do go wrong. And when you break mm -hmm. something as intricate as that, the whole thing's done. I mean, yep. How many camera repair shops are left in New York City? Not many. I, and I, I have, I've got a, a nice camera, mm -hmm. classic camera collection. It's funny. I, I went to Amsterdam once, and I'm known as a bit of a clumsy guy. Mm -hmm. I open up my I – mean, I'm at a cafe in Amsterdam, and, and I open up my camera bag, and, and, and I'm right by this ledge that goes down to the next level. Mm -hmm. And somehow two of my cameras got oh. hooked onto the mesh of the top of the bag, and as I open up the flap – Two cameras go down mm -hmm. to the next level. One of them was the Olympus C5050, mm -hmm. which was a fantastic uh, point-and-shoot uh, digital camera. And mm -hmm. the other one was a Contax, uh, Contax 2 mm -hmm. from 1954. Wow. Olympus goes down, splits into about 50 million pieces. <laughs> Contax takes a chunk of wood out of the floor. Of the floor. <laughs> <laughs> still operating. The rangefinder was a little off on uh -huh. it. I had to get that recalibrated. I was still able to use that right. That's the during the right trip. Yeah. I was still able yeah. to use that on the trip. You know, I felt bad about the wood mm -hmm. <laughs> going out of the floor. Yeah. But the other uh, camera I had to bring back in several pieces and never got to shoot yeah. it again. Which is another good point because, uh, you know, you could damage a film camera and still use it. Right. I mean... Within, to a certain extent. To yeah. a certain yeah. extent. And uh, not so much with digital. I mean, if something, you know, you can, yeah, and I have. Right. But, uh, you know, when things go wrong, they, they go wrong. Yeah. You know, you, you got to replace. The, me the, don't, mecha the don't mechanicals don't. in a lot of these digital cameras are as good as the, their film counterparts. Mm -hmm. But the problem is when something gets fried in the brain, yeah. you're mm -hmm. done. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yep. Well, I was telling you the other day about all the G-series Canon point and shoots that I had in the 2000s, the early 2000s, and... Right. Uh, I would go through about one a year because I would bump, you know, the lens would extend, which would right. also would activate the camera as well. And as soon as that lens would, I would bump it, it would throw it off a little bit. It couldn't extend or retract. Right. And the camera wouldn't go on and off and it was done. Focusing was done. Everything was done. Mm -hmm. And there goes my camera. And at the time, you know, what did they cost? Five, six hundred dollars. That's a lot of money. That was, yeah, yeah, that you know, was and still is a lot of money. For a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Maybe not for John. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that I got this gig. You yeah. Know. <laughs> One thing, I, I took some notes on what drives the turnover mm -hmm. on digital cameras. Film cameras, the the driving force, what caused the next one to come out was advances in motor drive, mm -hmm. advances, once autofocus came out, focus, yeah. advances in autofocus technology mm -hmm. and metering. Mm -hmm. And honestly, metering hasn't improved so much, I don't think. I, well, companies might argue that, but matrix metering used to be five segment, now it's 3,000 segment, mm -hmm. but you know, like, the averages are still working out to about the right. same. It's not like we were mis-exposing images before. But when you switch to digital, the megapixel race is is probably the biggest driver on mm -hmm. new cameras coming out. The thing that's caught up, the megapixel race for 
all intents and purposes, it has kind of plateaued. Right, it stalled for a little while, and then now, now it's now 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 Canon picked it back up, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if anybody wants to follow that or if they're going to wait for a while to see if people actually buy the new five DR or five DS. Yeah, but uh, you'll see in the biggest improvement, the thing that keeps recycling these, or not recycling, but I think what drives this is processor speed. Right. So that's that. You know, that is that the one thing you always and I always look for in the gear reviews is. What's the new? Is it is a new processor? What's what's what are the ISOs capable of? I'm not so concerned about megapixels because I know how big I'm going to be printing for the most part. I'm not right. having to worry about you know uh, billboards or anything. What like do you mean? That. What do you talk? What's this print? <laughs> this printing business? Cause this, well, well, we'll I get into that. I think most I people just like to get as many megapixels as they can so they can zoom in on their computer screen. <laughs> But we could go uh, way no, off on a tangent. But so th- those are the two things that I'm looking for: is hey, are they using a new processor? Mm-hmm. Because that's going to improve everything, mm-hmm. and some of these uh, cameras are even using quad cro- processors. Right. So that's even you know that they can act a lot more efficient. Th- those are two of the key things. Um, but we are also seeing vast improvements to other things that they're doing, but they're very peripheral. And right. I, I travel for B and H and go to lots of events, mm-hmm. and I speak to a lot of people, and everyone's asking me. What's the best camera? And I think mm-hmm. if you've ever worked sure. at B and H or any sort of retail store, you know that. What's the best this? What's the best mm-hmm. that? And I, mm-hmm. I like look. Can't I can't tell it. you that. Right. Tell me what your needs are. Tell me what you mm-hmm. are, are do are doing, and I'll try to figure out something. But you won't know until you get it into your hands. Um, so. And then they give you that look of like, come on, dude. Come on, oh, tell <laughs> me. <laughs> just tell me. <laughs> let's re- rewind for a second. We we talk about processors. You can say what's better. Like, tell us what is better about the five processor over the six or the four over the like the digit five digit six yeah or yeah. the x speed or everybody has their own clever names for these processors but right right well it's is that that the camera can be more efficient whether yeah. it's going to be more frames per second right. that you're going to get whether it's going to be longer uh, buffer longer exposures uh, you know cleaner longer exposures or mm-hmm. better higher isos those are usually the three mm-hmm. things you know it is a computer these days so it is doing about ten thousand things that we don't yeah. even know right. about yeah um it's weird how Speed is definitely an issue. We're looking at cameras that, on an SLR, it's how fast the mirror can move these mm-hmm. days. Back in the days of film, you had film advance, so right. four frames a second, three frames a second, that was blistering fast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now people are like, oh, that's only 10 frames a second? You know, yeah. that's know. that's not good enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> 10 frames a second? Yeah. Two and a half seconds, you're out of film. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. I mean, you not only out of film, but you probably ripped it out of the roll because it was right. going so right. fast. <laughs> so some of these upgrades, though, each upgrade doesn't always contain a new processor, and that's something that you really got to take a look at. I it think, is. Right? I try to treat the cameras a little bit personally, like our phones these mm-hmm. days. I definitely don't try to buy the next one right. because then we're just going to get stuck in this in this hole, right? Mm-hmm. This gas hole. Mm-hmm. I, have, I, have, mm-hmm. I have this and, strange opposition to odd numbers, so I only had even numbered phones until the latest generation com- came out. I won't mention the brand, but I had, I went back and got an odd number one because mm-hmm. I didn't right. like the new one. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. That was okay. that was how I paced myself. All right. No, and it's if you could at least <laughs> skip one generation, right? I think you're doing a little bit justice to the. Uh, you know, to the massive electronic waste that we're uh, <laughs> right. that yeah. we're laying because uh, as film people, we were holding on to them, I think, mm-hmm. and, and and passing them down to generations. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I gave my sister my first Pentax K1000, mm-hmm. still being used. Mm-hmm. Actually, it's being used less. I should ask her back for it because <laughs> I, I, I miss that camera. Um, but now the moment the newest camera comes out, your camera plummets in yeah. value. Yeah, yeah. When you talk about price points and the prosumer and consumer camera, digital cameras are cheaper than they used to be. Yeah. And we've talked about it's like a throwaway mentality where you got a new camera every year, every Mm -hmm. two years, and you just chuck the other one. These are still four-figure cameras. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. you can't buy... I remember when I was shooting film, the the Nikon N90, I think, came out, and it was maybe $450. Mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, that's a lot of money to spend on a camera. I don't know if I'm ready to make that... Yeah. Technological leap. To I, get... I own that one too. That was. Right. A... <laughs> you still have it? <laughs> no, I did. Plugs I did... into your sharp I, organizer. <laughs> I, I, I sold that one. I got uh, out quick on that one. Right. <laughs> but it, but now people are buying cameras I'm, that cost as much as a used car. I'm blown away. Yeah. And then I, 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 yeah. I always refer to the Highline because I walk the Highline, and I just look at the cameras that people have. Right. And I, I don't think I'm jealous, but I'm like, <laughs> how does this guy, you know, I kind of make my living with a camera. 
how come this guy has such better stuff than me? You know, <laughs> and, and that guy too, and this guy, and that guy yeah. over there, and this guy. And I mean, they were talking but, thousands of dollars yeah. for a vacation shooter, mostly. I mean, or, right. you know. Are they getting better photos? Better than me, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of nice gear, let me, let me talk about Leica. It's an old camera company. They've been around forever. They're uh, certainly established by this point. I'd say so, yeah. um, but the gaps between their cameras is very illustrates a lot of what we're talking about. Right. And when you go back, 1958 is when the M2 and M3 came out. Nine years later, the M4. Four years later, which was a digital refresh, the M5 came out in 71. And then it was 13 years before the M6 arrived. And then the big jump, M6 to M7, not technologically a big jump, but the largest uh, gap, 1984 to 2002, 18 years. Right. If you bought an M6 in 1984 and had a baby, you give he was going that. off to college or he, she was going off to college before you could buy the next best thing from Leica, <laughs> which is pretty amazing to think about. Like, yeah. that's a long wait. But they had their yeah. M6 TTL, which for them, right. that, they finally introduced TTL. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, so, and that sort of was, that was, boy, you, you couldn't get any better than that. And that's sort of what held it for them, I think, for so right. long. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we were talking about it yesterday, and the M4 to M5 was a quick jump. But the M5 was a clunker of a camera. It was a totally redesigned. It was the biggest. It was like the the tallest mm -hmm. right. camera. Um, there go the M5 sales from B and H. Exactly. <laughs> Way to go, Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> well, there there weren't many. There weren't many of them. Actually, yeah. if you have one now, you're probably don't use it. Just hold on. Collect it. Yeah. Because it, it it was just big and clunky. Um, and actually, you know, four or five years after that, they actually came out with the M4P, I believe it was, right. and that sort of was okay. So they actually went back, right? you know, because they were like, okay, we made a big mistake here trying to, you know, it's funny, Leica really has had the same body. Mm -hmm. what, what have they added to it? They've, you know, they've kind of, it's little touches. It's like mm -hmm. actually in between each model, there wasn't, it was like a, a TTL, it was a half refresh. It was the, it was actually offering different sight lines, different viewfinders mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for it um, once we've got into the M series. But boy, when they tried, it was a, it was a major revolt in the Leica world when they went to the M5 and they mm. quickly uh, went back to the went back to the old uh, molds right. <laughs> and, and, and rushed out probably one of their their most classic designs, the M4P, um, and that lasted a, a while till the M6. Right. Which so, is... you know, that reminds me because I think like the F4, the Nikon you were talking about before. They continued making that after they made other, you know, the F5 and whatnot. Right. So I mean, it was such a popular successful camera that I don't, I think, does that happen now i mean i don't not so much i think galen Rowell probably is responsible for that but the late <laughs> galen Rowell, because he's he had, was an f4 user the f5 came out and he went out publicly and said i don't like the f5 i like the f4 and mm -hmm. that probably as much as anything probably i'm mm -hmm. i'm totally speculating on right that, but it was I, a but great camera he that was the, used, the right? nikon guy right. and mm -hmm. if without his yeah, endorsement, the, f4 the f5 was kind of right right he was he, the, the f4 had, had a nice following i mm -hmm. i only i never owned one um but i, I definitely would read a, a ton about him people were just so because that was also yeah. the first real autofocus camera right. from nikon and and some say they've really ev everything has gotten sort of bigger and clunkier and since right. then it was kind of like an f3 with a little more tech built into it mm -hmm. it had all the great yeah. features of the f3 had the that utilitarian rugged look, mm -hmm. and then but it had autofocus, autofocus and yeah. matrix metering, all that stuff, which the F three had, but not actually. The F three was probably more center weighted only, right? Yeah, that wasn't matrix. Yeah. yeah. So, hmm. well, this is something that I just wanted to mention, and then we're going to jump ahead. But you talked about the eighteen year difference in passing on the cameras, and, and so did Gabe. And I talked to a lot of photographers, you know, top of the line pro guys, and um, they can all remember their first analog camera, their first film camera, oftentimes something that was given to them by their father or their mother, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they started shooting with it and they loved it. And, and many times they keep it. But then I asked them, well, what was your first digital camera or your, you know, and they don't remember. You know, they're yeah. like, yeah, I don't know. You know, you spin through them so fast. There's not that emotional attachment somewhat. Right. I mean, There's no fondness for it. I don't, yeah. I don't ever wake up in the morning and go like, oh, I miss my D100. I really wish I could go out and shoot with it. You know, like you God. never say that. God, God no. please, no. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. I have to sit next to this guy. Right. Right. But, but I think they are trying now with the retro look with a lot of the mirrorless cameras. You're, oh, you're absolutely. seeing these yeah. that now. Now they definitely look look better. I really appreciate what a lot of these companies are doing by actually thinking outside of the box and building something from the ground up. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Instead of just using the same chassis that we've been maybe using 
since the film days right. and ripped out the film innards and mm -hmm. stuffed it with right. digital innards. So, um, but oh. it's funny that the building from ground up, but still making it look something from the sixties or seventies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, then we're going to talk about your your Samsung here, which as a mirror right. NX one, which as a mirrorless though, is kind of evolving back to look just like a DSLR. Right. Mm -hmm. which yep. It's much closer in size to a regular DSLR than than yeah. a. I say traditional mirrorless mm -hmm. camera, even though traditional is <laughs> not the right term because mirrorless only been out for a few years. But it's if you're it bridges the gap in some ways. It's kind of, oh, I like something substantial in my hand, and the mirrorless is too small and too light for me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's got a nice grip to it. But one Easy. thing one thing about the Samsung is something I'd like to see in more cameras is firmware updates. DP Review just did their – review of the Samsung, which the, cam the camera came out last year, and DP review is usually faster, but if you read all the way through the review, they say, why wasn't this reviewed earlier? And they said, basically, it's because so many firmware upgrades have come up that they were waiting and waiting and waiting until they got to a point where they felt they could write about the actual camera that was in their hands. Mm -hmm. And that it might be annoying in a sense that you're not getting the best product right out of the box, right. but the fact that those companies are spending time to upgrade the thing you've already bought, so you don't need to get the next thing. Mm -hmm. Is what's impressive to me. Yeah, I think that's exactly that's what the next on our list here. And I wanted to mention, and we've been kind of, I guess, trashing the new cycle and digital right. cameras to some degree here. But the point is, in the past ten years, the advances have been incredible, and they validate the fact that a new camera should come out almost every year, every two years because of the advances that have been made. And uh, right. who's going to deny that? And then the second thing I wanted to bring up is what you just did, which is firmware. And I wonder how that's going to change things now that firmware is kind of an established part of your new camera. How's that going to change it? Are we going to be holding on to this NX1 for the next 10 years with just firmware updates? or uh, I, it think it, I think it just makes it go to that three- to four-year cycle, get yeah, there, get there, right. and, you're, and you're a little bit happier about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I own the X-Pro1 by mm -hmm. Fuji, and I... And I, I I'll, Obviously, love the look. I love the image quality that came out, but the focusing was right. frustrating. Um, <laughs> but diplomatic, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but there has been not at once a month, but they usually do a firmware upgrade. Fuji's been great too. Uh, every three four months, and they're doing things like making your shutter speed go higher use, by yeah. using a firmware upgrade. You can add an electronic shutter, shutter speed, yeah. so now you can get up to like you know right. past eight thousandths of a second or something like that. You know, and it's so that's pretty. What they can do with the firmware upgrade is pretty fascinating, but obviously right out of the box is you can obviously improve image quality because you can improve the algorithms that are, that are being written. You can improve focusing speed and tracking. The next firmware upgrade for the Fuji X-T1 is supposed to be monumental, and that's going to make tracking focus even better. That was one of the main things for it. Right. Um, and when the X when the X-Pro1 come out? The three years ago. Three years ago. So there, I mean, you're, there's people at Fuji that love this camera – and are making it better for everyone that bought it, mm -hmm. and and that also shows a cool they're, thing. they're they're listening, right? Mm -hmm. You know that 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 shows to, that tells me that Samsung, Fuji, and these companies that put out you know consistent firmware upgrades that they're listening to the feedback and they're trying to make give you a better product. I don't see as much, you know. I mean, I remember what what the five D Mark three, I think, when they made that massive audio firmware upgrade where you can mm -hmm. now do different mm -hmm. audio. That, that was like wow, you had a brand new. Thing. But you don't hear it so much. I mean, Nikon can probably do one firmware upgrade, right? Maybe two for their cycle of it. I don't hear about it as much as with again some of these mirrorless mm -hmm. ones, which maybe they're vying for more attention, mm -hmm. you know, to get that that piece of the pie. Um, but hey, if you're going to listen to the consumer, that's that's good in my book, and and, and I think that's to strive. To I think make that's a better the, product. I think that's the core of the firmware updates. Because when I've talked to company reps, it's always like we've listened to what our customers say, and that's why we have these firmware upgrades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I doubt there's somebody at Nikon right now working on a firmware upgrade for my D300. They're <laughs> no. You know, they're pro <laughs> they probably there's probably a few D300s in the closet the there. That the, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's still the current. It is yes, the, it's that it's is the last prosumer DX mm -hmm. camera from Nikon, and that came out. Uh, wait, when was that? 2004? Well, the other side of that is if the firmware is updated, but the plastic body on your camera has cracked and, you know, the guts are spilling right. out, yes. how good is it? I mentioned before, I, ha I have like about 40 classic cameras. Yeah. You know, every couple of years, you need to get maybe something calibrated or something like that. But the, the key component with all these cameras was they had to be working because I, want, I wanted to spend time with each uh -huh. one. And um, I used to go, I, have, I had, a, there was so many repair places. 
in New York City. Yeah. And I, there's not as many anymore. And then when you go in, they're just like, mm. okay, it's going to be actually more to repair this yeah. than for you to get the right. next version of or it. Or we'll just, send it back to Nikon and right. we'll charge you. Just yeah, for the yeah. record, the Nikon D300 came out in 2007. Okay. And it was discontinued in 2009. Oh, so it is discontinued. It was replaced by the S, yes. which ran for a, a oh, couple okay. of years. And then, but yeah. uh, but that, that hasn't been... 2007, that was... If, what's the math on that? Eight years ago? Yep. That was quick math, huh? Yeah. Impressive. I was checking some used prices for the D300, some, some Nikon cameras, and you can buy one now for $400 a body. I, which I was bought a second body a couple of years ago yeah. just to have a... Backup. So the D300S is still not, you can't get that at B&H now? Not new, no. Not, not new, okay. All right. Uh, we've touched on a lot of the subjects here. One thing we haven't touched on is the the realm of rumor sites and fanboys. I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for this. Because <laughs> we live in this, or we work in this bubble, and, you know, there's a review of every possible camera and there's 20 reviews. You just, it's right. it's crazy. There's 20 reviews, and then there's comments following each review. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how much this is driving the the industry or or not. I think that I think the, there there are a group of people that don't care and they walk in the store and it's all new and fresh to them and there's others that mm -hmm. spend weeks doing internet research. When yeah. I'll go back to 1996 in the Wayback Machine when I was researching my first SLR, you there was no internet, right. so you went, you picked up popular photography, uh -huh. and maybe sure. you could find a camera review in another magazine. I can't remember back then what was on the bookshelf, but that would, you could go through that in an afternoon and make a decision, a purchasing decision. Now you can, you you can be yeah. lost for you hours. Get lost. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody's got an opinion, and everybody has the ability to share that opinion online. <laughs> so you can't. It's there's a lot of noise out there, and the bottom line is every digital camera since. 2000 takes really good pictures. But. Well, I think we saw a massive um, improvement, you know, in the early 2000s when we shifted right. from CCD to CMOS sensors. Mm -hmm. right. There was a massive, a you point, know, yeah. uh, of shifting of image Bring quality. It. But now the the, the uh, upgrades are incre or more incremental. It's more of a brush and washer. Right. You know, some, <laughs> <laughs> something something that's that that's happening where you get a okay, you get that that not that. It's the, it's the four A processor, not the four, not from right. four to five, but the four A processor. Two point one two. You know, so <laughs> so I think again, you can wait uh, at least a generation. Mm -hmm. right. And here's the thing I would like to say is actually take that money and invest in good glass. Yeah, because sure. glass is still cool. the same, you know, and it's still glass is what lasts a lifetime. Right. And it, to what I think, at least glass should be lasting 10, 20 years. You could be passing that down. Mm -hmm. And if you take the time and invest in, good, good, point. in yeah. good glass, you know, then you're going to, A, your, your image quality is definitely going to skyrocket. And then whether you're full frame or you're APS-C or anything else like right. that, you know, it doesn't matter. You've got good glass in the front. Most right. digital cameras are up to par for right. it. And uh, a lot of, I, you say that, it's a, that's an, an incredibly good point because a lot of these D7200 users, that maybe made the jump from the 7100 to the 7200. What when I say jump, it was probably more of a stumble <laughs> or a half step. Well, they're putting that same kit lens on the new camera. Instead, they could have put that two thousand dollars towards some a professional lens and seen mm -hmm. an exponential increase in image quality work, yeah. on the same body. Yep, and yep. that and then save up for the next generation. Mm -hmm. That's that's great mm -hmm. advice, Gabe. Mm -hmm. yep. So I was thinking about gas, yeah, for a while. And I don't know if we did we define it as gear at the beginning. <laughs> I don't know. You want to define it now? <laughs> Please go. Gear acquisition syndrome. Syndrome, right? Yeah. So here, here I have a cure. I have one simple cure mm -hmm. that I, I, I want to post to all our listeners. That if you feel, and I think as we are humans, are naturally consumers for the most part, or at least eighty percent of them. Maybe there's twenty percent out there that can bypass that and have that D1 or that XT mm -hmm. one right, and then right. not know about anything for <laughs> 10 <Yeah>. years. <laughs> and that's great. Uh, but most of us, I think we're, we're in it. We are in a consumer society. So this is the, what I would challenge. Um, and, and I've done this challenge myself. It's a wonderful, either it can even become a project, but to the listeners, I would say, take one, take your one camera and shoot, just shoot with one lens, do it mm -hmm. for a month. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that'll, that'll cure you. That'll focus you, you know, and, and don't read, 
the fanboy websites, right. <laughs> you know, and just really focus on except on, for on the H. work. Except for being a Dot board can't find him. And that's not a fanboy. Right. That's a that's the source. Right. That's right. <laughs> right, right. Thank you. But but I think that's a good challenge that we all can, you know, take something out and, and, and help improve our vision. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's good that's good advice. Thank you, Gabe, for joining us today. And Todd, of course, thank you. Jason Tables, our wonderful engineer, thank you very much. For more photo news and reviews, check bnhphoto.com backslash explorer. Reach out to us on Twitter at BNH Photo Podcast and email any questions you have to podcast at bnhphoto.com. And one more thing, please leave us a review on iTunes. Positive reviews sure help. Thank you. <laughs>